Why is it when some British people are abroad that they expect everybody else to speak English? Have you noticed what they do when they're struggling to be understood? They just say it again in English, but louder. Job's three friends had a communication problem. They were trying to speak to him, but they weren't on the same wavelength as him. It was as if they were speaking a foreign language. And when they realised that their message simply wasn't getting through, they did what some Brits do abroad. They just said the same thing again, but louder. They got more and more frustrated and angry and their speech was more and more inflamed. We're looking today at the second round of speeches in the book of Job, delivered by the three friends of Job, and then Job responds to each one. There are three rounds of speeches altogether in the middle section of the book. In the first round, we saw that Eliphaz represented the voice of personal experience Bildad represented tradition and Zophar represented common sense. They all agreed that Job was being punished by God and that's why he was suffering. He must have sinned either just slightly or seriously or even secretly, but they were all wrong. Each of the three friends takes their turn to speak to him and Job answers. And now in this second round of speeches from chapters 15 to 21, the same pattern happens again. We're looking today at what the three friends say. And they become more and more unsettled, more and more disturbed. There's an increasing opposition towards Job and also towards the truth of God. Next time, we're going to look at what Job is saying in response. And in his case, he's becoming quieter and more settled and more secure in his understanding of the truth. As we hear from Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar again this morning, there are three stages of opposition to Job and to God. First of all, there is resistance to the truth. Let's look at what Eliphaz is saying in chapter 15. Eliphaz has been the most polite and diplomatic of the three, but now his tone of voice has changed. After he's heard Job continue to rage against God's dealings with him, he says, I spoke gently to you, verse 11, but you didn't listen, Job, and so I'm getting tough now. And he jumps on the bandwagon and calls Job a windbag, in verse 2, as Bildad had done, and an empty head, as Zophar had done, and also a hypocrite. So he's really now joining in with the other two. Eliphaz doesn't like the sound of Job's arguments. These are new ideas and he feels threatened and frightened because his system of belief and understanding of God and the world is crumbling. It all seems to overturn his faith and all he's ever known to be true. It challenges the very foundations of his belief system. It invades his comfort zone. He and his friends have put forward what they have always thought to be true. The righteous are blessed in this life. The wicked are punished in this life. Job himself had always thought that until now his own experience has forced him to rethink. Job is saying, no, it just isn't true. Take a reality check. Look around. That is not what you see in this world. In my experience, that's not what has happened. But Eliphaz can't cope with such a radical shake-up of his theology. He's like a child who looks at his food on the plate and because he's never tasted it before, says, 
I don't like it. I, I'm not going to try it. Eliphaz responds by defending his position, digging his heels in. He doesn't listen with an open mind. He doesn't carefully weigh up what's being said, but he sarcastically mocks what Job is saying and he returns the serve. Verses seven and eight. Are you the first man who was born? Or were you made before the hills? Have you heard the counsel of God? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? He uses Job's own words to argue back in verse nine. What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that is not in us? He tells him the elders are on our side, not yours. Both the grey-headed and the aged are among us, much older than your father. And he keeps making the same points that he's made before, harking back to the vision that he claims to have received in verses 14 and 15. What is man that he could be pure and he who is born of a woman that he could be righteous? OK, he says to Job. You say that you don't see the wicked being punished in this life. Just because you don't see it, it doesn't mean that it's not happening. It might be happening inwardly. It might be that they're being tormented by anguish and guilty fear. Verses 22 to 24. Trouble and anguish make him afraid. And one of these days, sooner or later, in this life, he'll get what's coming to him. The first step in opposing God is resistance to the truth. And that's what we see with Eliphaz. Eliphaz is disturbed by what Job is saying. He senses that there is truth in it, but he's too afraid to face up to that truth because he doesn't want to have his own thinking challenged or to have to change his mind. Many of us have a difficulty with that. How do you respond when you hear something from the pulpit or from a believer in conversation and you haven't heard it before and it doesn't seem to fit with what you've always thought in the past? How do you cope with new ideas do you feel threatened? Or will you listen carefully? How do you know whether it's true? What is the measuring stick? Well, scripture, as we've seen before, the Bible, God's word, is our measuring stick. Are you prepared to honestly examine what the Bible says and to rethink, if necessary, to adjust your behaviour, if necessary? Beware of resisting the truth. Don't silence the voice of God when he speaks to you in his word. Then when it's Bildad's turn to speak again, the opposition to Job and to God moves into a different phase. Not only now is there resistance to the truth, but there are false accusations. Let's hear Bildad in chapter 18. In fact, you can notice all the three types of opposition that we're mentioning in all of the three friends' speeches, but there is a progression. Bildad has already made up his mind that Job is guilty. He's acted as judge and jury over Job's soul. And he's tried and sentenced and condemned him without even listening to his defence. Listen, Job, your anger against God is just going to destroy you, he says in verse four. You think the world just revolves around you, don't you? You won't listen, you won't repent, you're stubborn. 
He describes the fate of the wicked in vivid language, like a light being snuffed out in a house, like an animal walking into a trap, like a deadly disease, and like fire that just destroys everything. And then he finishes by saying in verse 21, surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him who does not know God. And by that, he means Job. There's a temptation, a great temptation, to pass judgment on others, even on others within the church, congregation and community, to write them off in our hearts without really having the full picture about them. There is that tendency and temptation because we're fallen human beings and in any kind of society we want to be concerned about our own position in relation to others and if we can be slightly higher up and they're a little further down then we're happy. But you are not God and neither am I. Can you read the hearts of others? Can you accurately judge their motives and desires? Sometimes we wrongly base our assessments of fellow Christians or fellow human beings in general on what we have heard others say about them. And before we realise it, our judgment has been formed by gossip and slander. And we've allowed a distorted portrait of that person to be painted and coloured in with a few more prejudices from our own palette. God's people ought to be careful that they don't receive false accusations and that they don't create false accusations in their own minds. Suspicion should never be taken as fact. To believe something about a person without evidence is sheer unadulterated prejudice and it must be repented of. Judge not, said the Lord Jesus Christ, that you be not judged. Matthew 7 verse 1. Only when there is real evidence of wrongdoing should a matter be pursued, and then only in a biblical way, according to Jesus' instructions in Matthew 18, that's a key passage in that context, there must be witnesses, and also it must be done in a manner which is gracious and which hopes for the best in the person concerned. It's with the aim of restoring and reconciling, not dividing. Bildad was so set in his thinking that he could not change. His thinking was based on tradition, not on what God's word actually said. And so he misjudged Job and he did what the Pharisees did to our Lord Jesus Christ when he brought what seemed like new ideas to them. They made false accusations. And then when Zophar speaks in chapter 20, there's a third level of opposition. Not just resistance to the truth and false accusations, but now open hostility. Let's hear Zophar in chapter 20. There's an aggressiveness and a contempt and a despising of Job that comes through. Because, like the others, he feels threatened by the truth. He's disturbed in verse 2. Therefore, my anxious thoughts make me answer because of the turmoil within me. He speaks of evil as being like the poison of a cobra. But he almost spits out his own words with snake-like venom. He pronounces 
judgment upon Job with great fury. God's wrath will fall upon the wicked, he says in verse 23. The judgment of God will bring misery and despair. It will be like a sudden natural disaster or an attack of the enemy. Verses 23 and 24. The wicked person will be plunged into total darkness, he claims in verse 26, and cast into the fire to be destroyed. Now there's truth in what he says. It does sound like some of the language that Jesus uses to describe hell, eternal punishment. Where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and darkness and the fire that is never quenched. This is the sort of imagery that is used. But Zophar's anger is fleshly. It is worldly anger. It's not the pure, holy wrath of God. God, you remember, does not condemn Job, but he justifies him in the end. There's no mention of God's mercy in this speech of Zophar, and neither was there before in chapter 11. And yet, the whole point of the story of Job, James tells us in the New Testament in chapter 5 verse 11, the whole point is to show that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. The words compassion and mercy are not in Zophar's vocabulary. In verse 7, he says, yet he will perish forever, like his own refuse. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? There's no warmth there, there's no compassion there, there's no understanding. No, according to Zophar, God's blessing must be earned. It's what you do. Job, you haven't done enough. You must have got wealth by dishonest means. That's why God now is taking it away. You're lost. There's no hope for you, Job. He judges Job, but his own heart is wrong. When the heart is evil, Evil words and evil actions flow out, and his heart is not right with God. The opposition of Job's three friends towards God and towards his word was of the same type of opposition that Jesus faced from the enemies of the gospel. Although for him, it was even more intense. There was resistance to the truth. These new ideas which Jesus was explaining were actually not new ideas. They were not really any different from the true meaning and message of the Old Testament. But they were understood as something new and something um, radical. There was resistance to him personally. False accusations. He was put on trial and lies were told about him. And false claims were made of him. He had done no wrong. And then there was open hostility. When they could not find any legitimate charge against Jesus, they had him killed. Totally without reason or law. But even though Jesus suffered, even more than Job ever did, through his suffering, you can be saved. It was to deal the death blow to our sins, to take away our guilt and our condemnation. It was to bring you into the peace and joy and life forever in his presence that he alone can give. Pride and prejudice within the heart are two great obstacles to the gospel. But even these can be broken down by the gospel and by the power of God's spirit. Will you come as a little child, humbly and trustingly to Christ, to receive from him the gift of life 
and to walk in his presence, now and always.